All right, everybody, it's a quarter past 10 by the clock on the back, so I think I'm going to make a start. Um, thank you so much for braving a typical Melbourne cold, wet morning to come into Open Day. I really appreciate it. So my name's Dr. Matt Butler. I'm the Associate Dean of Learning and Teaching in the Faculty of IT, and it actually gives me great pleasure to be the first presentation uh, for the day for our Monash Open Day. So thank you again, everybody, for coming in. Um, just a reminder, if you've got two phones, if you could pop them on silent, um, that would be great. And as I mentioned, uh, for those latecomers, we are live streaming this um, uh, from the back of the room. So just keep that in mind, I guess, if, if when it comes to questions, uh, if you're a bit worried about that. So this is going to be a rapid fire 20 minute presentation. So uh, I'm going to be covering quite a bunch of things, so it's going to relate to a bit about the faculty, a bit about Monash in general, a bit about the courses that we offer, primarily focusing on the undergraduate courses. There'll be an opportunity for about five minutes of questions uh, at the end, but what I would say is that this is just to give you a bit of a taste and hopefully spark some things in your head about, ah, oh, that's a question I should go and find the answer to, or, oh, that's really intriguing, I need to find out a little bit more. As hopefully you'll have seen, the campus screen area there, the Lemon Centred Lawn, is covered in tents for our faculty. So please, um, if this inspires you to come and ask a question, please pop in and see somebody at one of the tents and, and ask a question. But I can also give you a bit of a hand at the end. So this presentation is deemed more broadly kind of your future in IT. Why do we call it that? I could stand here and just kind of say, we offer this course, we offer this course, and we offer this course. But I think what is really important is to actually kind of highlight why we think moving into IT is such an, an important and amazing thing to do right at this point in time, right? The future for technology has never been kind of brighter and, and more um, awe-inspiring, to be honest. Here's kind of just four things that are driving IT forward. For all of you who are looking for a job at the end of your degree, the amount that is being spent on IT, both infrastructure, systems development, research and development, all of those kinds of things is just kind of escalating at a quite dramatic rate. Worldwide IT spending uh, last year was around, projected around $3.7 trillion, and we know it's going up and up. And that's a lot of because of how the important part that IT plays in society, in business, uh, but also the amazing uh, potential still of technology um, in our everyday lives. And one of those things is artificial intelligence and machine learning. Who's heard the term machine learning? Yeah, there's a few, few. Who's heard of artificial intelligence? Come on, that's going to be everybody. Um, so the idea that computers, they don't replace humans, right? they're going to support us to help better decision making, to solve many of the world's big challenges, right? So that's the role that AI and machine learning can play. And, and there's so, so much still to develop and learn around those techniques and those technologies and how they might help us. That again is the reasons for this investment and this excitement around technology. Um, social media obviously is, is everywhere with the vast majority of the planet uh, using social media on a daily basis. And then we've got this whole automation of everything. We've got e-banking, e-shopping, e-payment, e everything. You can whack an e on the start of everything by the by the sounds of it. Talked a little bit about artificial intelligence. Um, again, I think it's really important to think about these technologies not kind of like, oh, this is the worry of what's going to happen, but the excitement and the opportunity that they bring. Uh, for example, here we talk about tracking human patterns. Uh, we're talking about smart home devices, virtual per, uh, personal assistance, fraud detection, all of those kinds of things. And I'll touch shortly on some of the amazing research that many of our um, staff here at the Faculty of IT do. Who's heard the idea of big data? Yeah, a few. Who's heard of like data science? This notion that, we, that we've got data everywhere. So for those of you standing up the front, feel free to come and grab a seat somewhere. Uh, so this idea that we are just we're surrounded by huge chunks of data, whether it's business data, whether it's education data, whether it's social data, all of those kinds of things. So how do we look at that data? What does it say? How will it solve some of the world's big problems? Like how do we use this to tackle climate change or you know, important social issues, um, in, you know, those kind of things? Uh, they're one of the things that we keep kind of keeps popping up. And if you've done kind of a job search 
in any times. I've already had this discussion with somebody this morning already, which they said, I think I need to do data science because that's what I keep hearing about. I hear about big data and I hear about data science, right? So that is one of the reasons as well. But we don't just have big chunks of data, we have this integration of now information and systems and things like that. So we've got hospitals needing to connect up, emergency services, finance, manufacturing, all of those kind of things. Increasingly, everything is becoming connected. Then we've got robotics. Um, who knows? Uh, you could be kind of catching your self-driving car to uni. So those of you in year 10, maybe, who's in year, kind of, who's in year 10 roughly about this time? Uh, two or three years, you might be getting your self-driving car to uni. We don't know yet, right? So we've got the robotic side of those kind of things, but we also have the machine learning, the artificial intelligence side of things as well. But then we also have the role that robotics can play in manufacturing, in rehabilitation, uh, rescue robots in assisting natural disaster zones, all these kind of things. Why I put these things out there is to say that IT now is lots of different things. It's more than it's ever been before. To the slide that lots of potential students like, lots of parents seem to like as well, around the role that, or the spot that the IT industry kind of plays in, in industry these days, with it's one of the highest salary averages in Australia. So, and that continues to, continues to kind of keep going, especially as we have these roles like data scientists, people who have expertise in AI, other systems development. I mean, everybody wants those people, right? And that's what drives the salary up. So being part of information technology is in, leaves us in a fortunate position, not only because the grand challenges that we have to solve are so amazing and so fascinating, but also that we can get paid pretty well to do that as well, which is really nice. Lots of different types of uh, IT jobs uh, keep, continue to go up. Uh, so we've got some of the ones that have been a bit more traditional in terms of web development, computer network um, professionals as well. The notion of business and systems analysts, those kind of uh, job roles keep going up. Software, apps programmers, those kinds of things. And as I mentioned, the need for things like data scientists and whatnot uh, continues to keep going up as well. So these are some stats that are quite easily available. And if you have a, have a chat, you'll see that while uh, more traditional parts of IT continue to be in high demand, there's all these, also these emerging roles that comes with technology that kind of start to come up as well, right? So that, again, that's what's really exciting. It's always important, I think, to talk a bit about why IT at Monash. Um, we've got a bunch of very smart people in the room because you've come to Monash for open day, so already you're like, oh, maybe Monash is a place I'd come to like to come to study. I think it's really important to, to kind of put that into a bit of context, right? So Monash is one of the group of eight universities in the country, which means we are very research-led. Right? Um, so I'm a, a researcher as well as a teacher, um, and, and the vast majority of our academic staff are as well. And we think that research-informed education is vitally important. I've just talked a bit about the emerge, some of these emerging aspects that are coming through. A lot of those need researchers to drive the innovations. And then if we've got researchers who are also educators, that starts to creep in and really inform our education practice. So that's what we mean by world-renowned academics and researchers. And I'll talk a bit more about that in a sec. Um, we've got accredited undergraduate degrees by the Australian Computer Society. So it's not just a bunch of kind of crusty old academics, I guess, saying this is what we think is important. It's also the Australian Computer Society, the peak kind of body in the country that tries to inform what they see as the important aspects of um, an IT professional, informs our education uh, programs as well. Teaching innovation is vitally important, not just for the um, faculty of IT, but also for the university. Uh, who came in the front entrance off Wellington Road? Yeah, did you see the kind of big building with the kind of wavy-ish kind of things at the front? That's what's uh, called the Learning and Teaching Building. It's kind of a, you know, name's fairly, fairly obvious. Um, but if you have a chance to kind of have a poke through the Learning and Teaching Building today, I would really advise you to do so. When you go in there, you will see that all of the teaching and learning spaces are not what you would think are traditional teaching and learning spaces. Um, there aren't really rooms like this. 
There are flat rooms that hold 30, 60, 90, 120. There's 180 seat in the round space. There's a 300 and something space, kind of slightly tiered lecture theater. These spaces are all designed to push people like me to teach in different ways. Gone are the days where every class should be just the, the, the wise person at the front. Uh, it's about co-creation of knowledge. It's about working with each other, with peers, to kind of deeply understand content. And so as such, we have spaces that, that kind of um, drive that. Why I say I think it's really important for you to pop into there is if you've also kind of look over that way in the campus, you'll find a big construction site, which is what is going to be our forthcoming uh, Woodside building um, for technology uh, and design and education. Right? So it's going to be similar to the learning and teaching building, but a dedicated space for IT and for engineering to really drive teaching innovation forward. And for those of you that are looking to start even as soon as next year, we'll be in that building. Right? So it's a really exciting time to, for, as, as an educator to be on this campus, um, but also hopefully for any student who's looking to arrive as well. The industry experience opportunities that we have as part of the Faculty of IT are huge, and I'll talk a little bit more about our industry-based learning uh, program shortly. But I would say that we have, uh, we're kind of the envy of, of um, all universities in the country in terms of the, the breadth of our industry-based learning uh, program. So I'll talk a bit more about that in a sec. And we are a dedicated faculty to teaching and learning. What that means is we're the only dedicated faculty of IT in the country. What that is, is a sign from the university about how seriously it takes this as its own discipline. And it also allows us to get a diverse bunch of technologists, researchers, educators, all in the one group who can then riff off each other and build off each other and work together to create true interdisciplinary kind of strengths as well. And it also means that our outreach to other parts of the university and industry it is, is um, massive as a result as well. I've talked a bit about the uh, Woodside building, uh, formerly known as the kind of TED building, but now um, formerly known as, now officially known as the Woodside building. <laughs> Um, so I've talked a little bit about that as well, some mock-ups of the spaces, but again, spaces designed to really inform teaching innovation and put people like me, uh, you know, outside my comfort zone, which is what you want, right, as a student. Just to touch on a little bit around why we think our faculty uh, is excellent, I guess, as it were. Uh, we're now the leading software engineering research group in the country. So we have a Bachelor of Software Engineering that we teach with engineering and our researchers are the envy of the country, if not the world, in terms of um, the research that we've got happening there. We've argued with the leading blockchain cryptocurrency research group in Australia. Who knows all about blockchain? Mm, cryptocurrency? If I say Bitcoin? Yeah, okay, we get a few more, all right? So uh, please, anyone standing, feel free to come and grab a, grab a seat. Uh, Blockchain is not just Bitcoin, right? Blockchain is a technology that could fundamentally change a lot of the way that the world works in terms of uh, how we can put more trust into financial systems or voting or anything like that, right? So again, this is one of the main areas, technology areas that is growing and we have arguably, you know, the, the leading research group in there, which again then will inform our education um, programs. One of the leading optimization research groups in the world. So if you're thinking about computer science, optimization is a big part of that as well. And we have the largest academic data science research group in the Southern Hemisphere. I've already talked a bit about data science as well. That's the people in the faculty. That's the people who would be teaching you on a day-to-day -day basis. And that's people, they're the strength that those people have that inform our education programs. Uh, a bunch of just different headlines from different things that uh, our academic staff do. Um, so we've got people who are working with the um, Australian Federal Police to really use AI machine learning techniques to um, look at a lot of the criminal activity and, and, and dodgy stuff that's happening on the web. Um, right through to, you can actually see an example of uh, virtual Angkor Wat. 
So if you go over into the tent in there, um, so Tom and his his group have got a VR experience to then immerse yourself in in ancient Angkor Wat from I think 12th century ish. I think so. Um, amazing stuff that our, our academic staff are doing, and you can see lots of examples over there. So, what can you study at Monash? This is, I said, going to be a rapid fire, just to give you a teaser, which you can then go and bombard people like myself or anyone over in the tent there with questions. With regard to undergraduate degrees, we have a comprehensive degree, which is our Bachelor of IT, and inside that you'll do one of five majors. I'll talk a bit about that in a sec. We have a Bachelor of Computer Science, which is what we call a specialist degree, and where you can specialise in either advanced computer science or data science. We have an advanced honours version of the Bachelor of Computer Science. There is also a Bachelor of Software Engineering. And also kicking off next year is our Bachelor of Applied um, Data Science, which is co-taught with the Faculty of Science. So just a quick bit, a bit about the Bachelor of IT. I often get asked what's the difference between Bachelor of IT, a Bachelor of Computer Science and a Bachelor of Software Engineering. Here is the really uh, short, pretty factually correct, but a bit fuzzy kind of thing around how to differentiate those. I, I like using Google Maps is not a bad example, right? So let's, everyone knows Google Maps or some kind of maps thing, right? Okay, if I am a computer scientist, what I'm probably solving with Google Maps is how are we doing the routing? How am I going to make sure that when somebody says, I need to get from home to Monash Clayton, I'm going to get them there in the fastest way possible and I'm going to understand all of the constraints that exist around traffic and around or the public transport or whatever. And I understand all of those things and I'm going to do some kind of route optimization to get you there the quickest. That's something a computer scientist might do in there. The next thing is, well, we need Google Maps to run at scale for millions and millions of users on mobile, on desktop, tablets, all those kind of things. We need to perform optimally. That might be a bit of a software engineering problem, right? We're talking about a big, large scale system that has to deal with many parts and things and we're talking a bit about hardware and a bit about software, about making sure that runs well. Right? At scale, it's a bit of a software engineering problem. Interface, we need to make sure the interface is intuitive. That again, it it's, looks good and works well on mobile, um, on desktop, all those kind of things. That could be a bit of a software development type challenge. Could be a bit more of a Bachelor of IT challenge. That's a very broad stroke way to delineate between the three but it might just be a way to then engage some of our um, degree experts with um, a bit of a conversation about these things. So Bachelor of IT, three years, ATAR of around 80-ish. When you do it, you do eight common units and you'll choose eight that are a major. But business information systems, networks and security, games development, interactive media or software development. You can mostly do two majors as well. Right, in terms of your course map, because you also have eight electives, which is great. The great thing about those eight electives is that pairs well with other degrees to do a double degree. Right. So I'll talk a bit about double degrees in a sec. That's all of the different kind of sub areas that you can do. And I'm going to go quite quickly, because as always happens, 20 minutes goes late. But Bachelor of Computer Science, three years. ATAR around 84, 85, roughly. Um, once you get into computer science, you can then do a bit of a specialization in advanced computer science or data science. Right, so you get to choose a sequence of four or five subjects down the stretch. And the kinds of things you'll get into are um, data scientists, analytics professional, all those kind of things. There is also an advanced version of this with an ATAR of around 95. Select entry because what we do is we embed research principles and practice throughout your degree. So it's four years, and you'll come out with a four-year kind of honours degree out of part of this. We get you involved with research groups as part of your training as well, right? Because of the ability to kind of give you that real kind of uh, tight research experience, Interscore is up, because we expect a lot of you, we can only take less students in. But amazingly demanding, but amazingly rewarding as well. Software engineering, 
is managed by the Faculty of Engineering, but we teach the vast majority of things in it. Once you do your common first engineering year, you'll get into three years of software engineering practice. Has dual accreditation by Engineers Australia and the ACS, which is great, um, and I've talked a bit about there. ATAR, as you can see, up around the 92 mark, and we can certainly provide some course advice around software engineering as well. I've already talked a little bit about these things before, and I'm just going to quickly go through because the sign in front of me says zero minutes, which is I'm sort of eating into my question time. But I've talked about industry-based learning. Everyone does capstone. We have a bunch of, of programs at a faculty level and a university level to push you. The worst thing is when a student comes in, does their, assignment, does their work, goes home. We want to get you here. We want to get you into industry team initiatives. We want to get you into peer mentor programs. We want to get you into get you into entrepreneurship programs. These are other reasons why you would come to our faculty and, and Monash University to study. Talked about IBL placement. These are all the kinds of organisations that you can be working at. The banks, the major consulting firms, those kind of things. Please speak to someone about IBL and there is a, there is a, um, a presentation about this later on today. I'll probably just finish with this, which is to say uh, the double degree options that you've got are huge. That is, again, one of the really important things, I think, that comes from coming to a, a university like Monash University, is we have 10 faculties, and we have a double degree with almost all of them. Right? Because IT by itself is pretty great. IT with, a, with another ex set of expertise or context in which to apply it is incredible, and that's where we're at, right? It's IT in business, it's IT in art and design, it's IT in education, it's IT in engineering, it's IT in science. So the ability to do, to do double degrees at this university, I think is, has got to be one of the big selling points and we're always happy to talk to you about that. There are also scholarships and things available, so please chat to us about that. I've also talked a little bit about the entry requirements. Um, there are also alternate pathways if you don't get the ATAR score through Monash College, through TAFE programs, through transfers from other courses. We're all happy to, to talk to you about that today. There is also postgraduate study. So please come and chat to us about postgrad if, you, if you're keen. Um, data science is gangbusters, a Master of IT is gangbusters, and Master of AI is just starting next year. Right? Again, because that's what industry wants. That's what research organisations want from us. So that is me. I took 22 minutes, I apologise. Sorry to the timekeepers. Sorry to the Dean who's... I haven't eaten your time yet, John. It's okay. I've got some time probably for a handful of questions and I think we've got a few roving mics. So um, I'm happy to talk individually, but um, any questions? Yep. Yes, um, I noticed that there is a major call um, gain development under the Bachelor of Information Technology. Yep. And may I ask what is the difference between game development and game design? Because many students will have a confuse about it. Yep. Okay. So it's almost like I planted you in the audience because games is my area that I teach into. Um, so I would say that our view on games development in this faculty is games development at a much more technical side. Less so at the artistic side, but I'll put a caveat in there as well. So our games development major, you will do three slash four levels deep of C++ programming. You'll do AI programming. You get pretty heavy into that kind of thing, right? You also do foundations of 3D modeling. You also do game design, fundamental game design, which I teach, which is no technology. It's all pen and paper and cards and dice and all kinds of craziness. Right? But we focus more on the technical side of things. Um, we do have an interactive media major where you can go quite deep into 3D modelling to VR and AR, sound, those kind of things. But our games development major is a bit more technical. That can be a bit different to games that's offered by other organisations or institutions where they focus a bit more on the how do things look and the modelling and all those kind of things. We're a bit more technical. Yep. Any other questions? Don't be shy. Yes, got another hand. On average, how long does it take for a graduate with a post uh, undergraduate degree to get a job from Monash? Oh, 
I, look, to be honest, I can't give you an exact number of like, uh, as soon as you graduate, most people finish, get a job in X amount of months or, or, or days or whatever it is. What it would say though, in terms of probably giving you the best opportunity to get a job, that what we offer. So our industry-based learning program, I think is again, really important to highlight. So we have in the order of 300-ish odd students that go into that program. Um, I don't think it's, I don't think it's wrong to say that many, many of those students who have a, a, a placement as part of the IBL program end up working at that company, right? The reason because you're a known quantity, right? You've worked with them for 20 weeks or so. They know you, you know them. If we're all good, they think you do a good job, they just want to hire you, right? So I think that's one real benefit of our IBL program. Um, the other thing is probably the things I glanced over in terms of other employability skills that I would say our, um, our degrees because they're accredited by the Australian Computer Society is then what the industry wants. But then we also have those other initiatives around industry initiatives, the opportunity to do for doing capstone projects with industry are all things that I think increase your chance of then stepping straight into a good graduate position or a job on exit. So that's a bit of a roundabout answer because um, I don't have the exact number, but I think that the things that we can provide you as a faculty and a university really raise the, the opportunities there. Yep. Yep, another question. I understand, I understand from people outside, students, that you need to get an average of about 65 in order to be considered for the IBL program. If and this really has to be an approximate answer, so I'm not trying to narrow yeah, yep. things down, of those people who get an average of 65 and apply for the IBL, roughly what fraction would actually succeed in getting a placement? Would we be talking about half, two thirds? To be honest, I don't know the answer to that. I could probably actually get you a pretty decent answer to that afterwards, if you like. Um, so I can chat with the person that runs the IBL program and they'll know how many apply and how many get a spot. Um, I, I guess another response to that, so it is, it is fairly competitive, right? Um, but what I would say is that missing out is certainly not the end of the world and doesn't you know, diminish your chances of getting good position out there. All of our capstone projects engage industry to varying degrees, right? So if you don't get into the IBL program, that doesn't mean you don't get exposed to industry. You get exposed to industry through your capstone third year project. So um, that's a roundabout answer and we can get some, some better hard and fast numbers. But um, what I would say is that IBL doesn't chop that off, so yeah. I understand, so would it be fair to say when you therefore look at a typical graduating class uh, that 80% or more have a job within 12 months? I'm sure you guys have surveyed this sort of data. Um, yeah, so, uh, so w look, we'd have, sim we'd have that kind of data around. I'm, I'm just not in a position probably to give you a good answer to that. So, we'll, we'll fit, yeah, I can help you out with that. Okay, thanks. And on that, I'm getting the big wind up and wrap up. Um, sorry that was such a whirlwind. Thank you all so much for coming out nice and early and braving the cold and the wet. Please enjoy your stay here at Monash and I hope to chat to all of you soon.